Hello everyone, welcome to chapter 11. So in this chapter we will talk about amino acids and proteins. So in this lecture we will discuss proteins and amino acids and how amino acids can work as acids and bases. We will talk about the formation of peptide bonds. We will talk about protein structure, the primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary levels. And finally we will talk about protein hydrolysis and denaturation. So before you come to this chapter, so please be sure to review how to calculate pH from H3O+, how to write the equations for reactions of acids and bases, how to name carboxylic acids and how to form amides. So let's start with proteins and amino acids. So proteins are the, these protein molecules compared with many of the compounds we have studies are generally gigantic. So for example, the horns of animals are generally made of proteins. Uh, and these are some things that you might not see in general. Proteins are ubiquitous and they are everywhere in your body. And proteins in the body are polymers. They are made from 20 different amino acids. And these proteins can differ in characteristics and functions that depend on the order of amino acids that make up the protein. So these proteins also form structural components such as cartilage, muscles, hair and nails. So they also function as enzymes to regulate the biological reactions such as digestion and cellular metabolism. So proteins including hemoglobin and myoglobin transport oxygen in the blood. So these are ubiquitous and they have many many purposes in your own body. Next let's classify proteins and their functions. So we classify them based on their functional uh, properties. First class of proteins is structural proteins. So first class is the structural proteins. These are structure they these provide the structural components. Main two of them are collagen, collagen and keratin. Collagen is the one that is present in tenders and cartilage. Keratin is the one that is in hair, skin, wool and nails. Next you have the second one contractile muscles. Contractile proteins which are made which make the muscles move. So there are two of them, one is myosin and actin, so they try to contract the muscle fibers. Next you have number three, transport proteins. These are the ones that carry essential substances throughout the body. There are two of them mainly, hemoglobin and lipoproteins. Hemoglobin transports oxygens, lipoproteins transports lipids from, uh, lipids through non-polar polar substances. Number four you have storage proteins. These are the ones that store nutrients. One of them is casein, which is the protein in milk, stores protein in milk, and ferritin, which stores iron in the spleen and liver. Next, you have number five, hormone proteins. These are the ones that regulate the body metabolism and the nervous system. For example, one of them is insulin, which regulates the blood glucose level, and the other one is the growth hormone, which regulates the body growth. Next, six, you have enzyme, enzymatic proteins, which are the catalysts of biochemical reactions in the cells. So the two of the two examples would be sucrase is the enzyme that hydrolyzes sucrose. Trypsin is the enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of proteins. Next you have seven protection proteins. These are the ones that recognize and destroy foreign substances. So best example of these are immunoglobulins. These stimulate the immune responses in your own body. So proteins have varying, varying purposes and they generally do very, very different tasks so from one another. So proteins are made from the building blocks. So the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. So amino acids are the molecular building blocks of proteins and they have a central carbon atom. We call it the alpha carbon and bonded to two functional groups. Remember the term amino and acid. So the name comes from the fact that it actually is connected to two different functional groups. It contains an ammonium ion which is NH3 plus and a carboxylate group COO minus. And a hydrogen atom and an R group on the side chain in addition to the carboxylate and the ammonium groups. So this is the alpha carbon. You have the carboxylate group, you have the amine group and on the top you have an R group. R group can be any one of these structures. R group are different structures based on the different protein. But on the other side, there is always a hydrogen. So this is the one that varies from one type of one type of amino acid to the other type of amino acid. So at physiological pH, which is in the pH level in your body, the ionized ammonium and carboxylate groups give the amino acid a balance of positive and negative charges. 
which when you consider it as an overall zero charge because one is plus and the other is minus so which results in an overall zero charge so this is called as a neutral amino acid which is generally called as a zwitterion so zwitterion is the structure that results in the formation of a neutral amino acid and it generally occurs at specific ph values we call it the isoelectronic isoelectric point or pi so we'll talk more about it as we go along in the lecture now how do you classify amino acids so there are 20 different amino acids we can classify amino acids using their r groups that are attached to the carb alpha carbon so they can be non polar amino acids polar amino acids polar and neutral amino acids polar acidic amino acids and polar basic amino acids so let's start with non polar amino acids these are the structures that have either hydrogen alkyl groups or an aromatic r group attached to the alpha carbon in in place of the r group here you have polar amino acids which have r groups that interact with water and which make them hydrophilic remember that non polar means that these are hydrophobic amino acids uh, hydrophilic are the ones that are polar amino acids now let's start with polar neutral amino acids these are the ones where the hydroxyl groups is neutral example of them is hydroxyl group a thiol an amide as an r group next you have polar acidic amino acids which contains basically a carboxylate ion another carboxylate ion attached to already carboxylated amino acid you have a basic structure which contains an ammonium r group that is attached to the structure so in summary there are 20 different ones or 20 different one of them and the non polar ones there are nine of them and these are generally hydrophobic hydrophobic the rest 11 are hydrophilic substances and out of them there is six polar substances that are neutral two of them that are polar and acidic three of them that are polar and basic so which ones are neutral the ones that contain oxygen and sulfur atoms but without any charge polar acidic substances are the ones that contain carboxylate groups and a negative charge polar basic are the ones that contain ammonium groups and a positive charge and non polar groups generally contain non polar r groups so let's start with the non polar amino acids these are the nine non polar amino acids glycine alanine valine leucine isoleucine phenylalanine methionine proline and tryptophan so these are the non polar groups notice that all of these the r groups are either alkyl so the first five of them here glycine alanine valine leucine and isoleucine all contain a general structure of a alkyl group so they have an alkyl or hydrogen next you come to phenylalanine this has aromatic structures and you have methyl ionon so this is alkyl but it also has a sulfur in it so it also has a sulfur group inside it so it's a sulfide based structure and you have proline which again has an alkyl group but this is a cyclic alkyl group and you have an aromatic structure on tryptophan next let's talk about polar amino acids which are neutral so polar amino acids these are the ones that are polar where the r group is an alcohol thiol or an amide so serine is the first one with an alcohol group threonine is the one again with an alcohol group tyrosine is again with the one with an aromatic alcohol group you have cysteine with a sulfur thiol and you have aspergine with also an amine group but here it's an amide so notice that it is a c double bond o nh2 which is an amide again you have an amide group here so there are two amides these two are amide structures aspergine and glutamine and cysteine is the one that contains a thiol tyrosine is the one that contains an aromatic alcohol so the rest of them are alcohol groups so this is how we can classify the polar amino acids which are neutral next let's come to the charged r groups so an amino acid is charged when the r group is a carboxylate or an ammonium ion group so which means that here so we can take the same exact amino acids and let's consider how to draw the twitter twitter ions of amino acid serine and aspartate let's take serine structure so serine structure involves the entire structure but in place of what we do here is we basically take in the nh3coh and write down the structure basically make sure that one is positive and the other is negative 
if you take aspartate, aspartate, if you take aspart aspartame, you notice the structure here. Aspartate basically contains the exact same structure but with the COO minus attached to it. So there are two COO minus acids and then one NH2 group. So this is the zwitter ionic structure of aspartate. Now, how do you recognize this amino acids and how do you name them? So these are generally given as abbreviations. The reason we give them abbreviations is because it's easy to understand the structures. So we use a three letter of abbreviation that is generally derived from their names and we also use one letter abbreviations to allow faster transfer of data as we write down the structures. So of the 20 amino acids, we have 11 of them that have one letter abbreviations that are same as the first letter and in their names and nine use different letters. For example, arginine uses R because aspartame can be written as the same A. So we use R to start with the structure. Tyrosine has Y because it's a second letter. So next we have phenylalanine because the pH smells, you know, sounds like F. That's why we use F here. Lysine, we use K because in the letter of the alphabet, K is after L is after so K is after L so that's the reason why which is nearest to the L in the alphabet now there are isomers as well for amino acids so just like uh, sugars there can also be stereoisomers of amino acids so they also exist in the DL stereoisomers we call them enantiomers so we draw Fisher projections for the alpha alpha amino acids by placing either so how do you draw the Fisher projections? Number one, always place the carboxylate group on the top, the R group at the bottom, and the NH3 group, if it is on the left side, we call it the L isomer. If it's on the right side, we call it the D isomer. So make sure that the carboxylate is on the top and the R group is on the bottom. And once you keep it that way, if the NH3 is on the left side, we call it L. If it's on the right side, we call it D. So pause the video right here and try to name this structure. So notice that here the COO is on the top and the group is on the R group is on the bottom. Here also COO is on the top, R group is on the bottom. Here NH3 is on the left side, here NH3 is on the right side. Now first thing we need to do is compare it with all the alcohols that you have seen. Notice that this is the one that contains a phenyl group and a CH2. This is phenyl and LN. sorry this is phenyl alanin yeah. so phenyl alanin and this is on the left side so we write L phenyl alanin and you have CH2OH attached to it so if you remember the original structure of CH2OH notice that the structure is for serine so this is NH3 is on the right side so we write D serine this is how we can name the structures based on the positioning of the NH3 group. Now, let's talk about essential amino acids. So, there are 20 amino acids in total that are used to build proteins in the body. Out of them, only 11 can be synthesized in your own body. The other 9 are the essential amino acids that you have to get from proteins in the diet. So, these are the essential ones. Histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan and valine. So these are the nine amino acids that are called the essential amino acids. The reason we call them essential is because these are not produced in your own body and you need it from supplements. The supplement can be food, the supplement can be direct uh, in ingestion of the protein themselves. Now complete proteins then such as eggs, milk, meat and fish generally contain all of the essential amino acids. But there are also what we call incomplete proteins. These are the ones that you get from grains, beans, nuts or that are deficient in one or more essential amino acids. So that's the reason why meat has to be a part of your diet. And if you do not consume meat, you have to find a way to make sure that you receive all the essential amino acids in the exact quantities that are required by your body. Next, let's talk about amino acids as acids and bases. So we said that an amino acid exists as a zwitterion at physiological pH and it can act as a base or an acid and it stays neutral at isoelectronic point. So when an amino acid with both positive and negative charges is overall neutral in charge, we call that we said to be at isoelectronic point. So this structure that you see here is a common structure of an isoelectronic point of a protein. <coughs> 
so this is the pi of glycine at 6.0 now what is this isoelectronic point so the isoelectronic point of an amino acid is basically the ph at which the charged groups on the amino acid are balanced and the amino acid is neutral now an amino acid can exist as a positive ion if the solution is acidic which means it has lower ph than its pi it can exist as a negative ion if the solution is more basic which means it has a higher ph than its pi so what are the ionized form of these acids so the pi values of non polar and polar neutral amino acids generally range from 5.1 to 6.3 now if you take alanine at its ph of 6.0 it has a zero overall charge at its pi of 6.0 with a carboxylate ion which being negative and the ammonium cation which becomes positive now alanine basically adds a h plus to the carboxylate group when it is becoming more acidic so creating an alanine which has an entire cooh group attached which results in the formation of a positive charge because the solution becomes becomes more acidic now if the solution has a higher ph than 6.0 then the nh3 group will lose a h plus ion and forms an amino group so which results in the formation of a negatively charged alanine ion so because both co group has a negative charge and alanine has an overall negative charge will have a higher negative charge at a ph greater than 6.2 now what happens when you change the change in h plus if the ph is less than pi which means that if it is acidic then the h plus concentration will increase if ph is equal to pi there is no change now if ph is greater than pi h plus will decrease in terms of carboxylate ion or carboxylic acid so when you have ph less than pi it forms a cooh ion when ph is greater than pi it forms a co co minus ion and ph equal to pi it stays a co minus now when in terms of ammonium ion when ph is greater than pi it converts into nh2 but in the rest of the states it stays as nh3 plus now when it is acidic it becomes positively charged when it is basic it becomes negatively charged for it to stay neutral the ph should be nearly equal to pi so this is a the, these are the ionized forms of polar acidic and polar basic amino acids so pause the video right here and try to solve this problem they are basically asking you which structure represents alanine at a ph above its pi so notice that when ph is greater than pi it means that this is more acidic most more basic so which means this time it has to have an nh3 group sorry an h2 group with a coo minus existent so this is the coo minus is existent and it has an nh2 group so which means this is the structure so alanine below its pi will be number 1 now consider the amino acid here with a pi of 6.2 so at a ph of 3.2 so how does leucine change here how will it change here first thing that happens is that ph is less than pi first thing that happens is that it adds cooh so this basically converts to the structure this becomes cooh at a ph of 3 right when ph is 3 this happens here now what a ph of 9 this becomes nh2 right so this becomes nh2 at ph of 9 so this is how the leucine will change next let's talk about peptides so a peptide basically is a bond is an amide bond that forms between the cooh group of one amino acid and the nh3 plus group of the next amino acid so the combined form is what we call as a peptide bond so this basically links two or more amino acids by peptide bonds and this combination Cob is called as a peptide. So what happens? Let's say, for example, we are talking about glycine and alanine. When glycine COOH minus group bonds with the NH3 group, it creates the glycyl alanine structure. And the bond that forms here between CO NH, so bond C double bond O bond NH here is called as the peptide bond. So this bond here is called as the peptide bond. So this peptide bond results in the removal of a H2O molecule. So two hydrogens will go from the amino group. So two hydrogens and one of the oxygen will move 
and form H2O and this is a dehydration reaction which means that the there is a removal of water molecule from the structure and this creates the combined GA peptide so this is the structure that creates the form. Now the linking of two or more amino acids by peptide bonds clearly forms a peptide. So when peptides form from two amino acids we call them dipeptides when you have three amino acids tripeptides four amino acids tetrapeptides and five amino acids pentapeptides anything longer than five when you have longer chains of amino acids we call them polypeptides so remember this names polypeptide so what is a peptide bond a peptide bond is basically an amide bond it bonds when you have bond COO bonds with NH3 plus so what happens here is that the two hydrogens and one of the oxygens will move out of the structure and the carbon will bond with the nitrogen resulting in the formation of a C double bond O NH bond. So this here is an example of an peptide bond. So how to draw the peptide bond? So first draw the structures of each of the amino acids in the peptide starting with the N terminus and step 2 remove the oxygen atom from the carboxylate group and two hydrogen atoms from the ammonium ion in the adjacent amino acids and finally use the peptide bonds to connect the amino acid residues. So for example here what do we have to do first? So we have to remove this oxygen and we have to remove two hydrogens from here and both of them will combine and create H2O. Now whatever is left write down the entire structure So you have the NH here and combined it with the structure that you have here. So let me write this in red so that you understand it clearly, the other amino acid. So the bond that we are talking about specifically is this bond. So this is the peptide bond. How do you know it's a peptide bond? So notice that it will have this the natural C double bond O NH structure. So once you notice C double bond O NH that is the peptide bond. So how do you name it? So this is serine and you have THR. I'm sorry, let me find the name for that particular structure. Sorry, 309. So this is serine and triolyne, 309. So we can write it as SER, THR or the name will become Seryl 309. So this is the combined dipeptide. So you can start naming more and more peptides as you go along. So the name of the peptide begins with the name of the N terminus and the amino acid residue. So we start with the N terminus which is the north end of the structure and gives all the following amino acid residues with the C terminal amino acid with iron or 8. So the N terminus is the one that contains the nitrogen and the C terminus is the one that contains the carboxylate ion. So we are always looking for the N terminus here, the N terminus to the C terminus. So N terminus here is the end structure So and the C terminus is the one that contains the C terminus structure. So we start naming the N terminus side and the C terminus side will end with iron or 8 depending on and we generally replace them with iron and it retains the complete name of the C terminus amino acid 
and the tripeptide of alanine, glycine and serine here. Notice that alanine is the one that's going to bond with glycine. Glycine is the one that bonds with serine. So which means this one, these two will have the N terminus and serine will have the C terminus. So serine will stay the same but the one that has the N terminus will become alanyl glycyl. So you have glycyl, serine and methionine. So it becomes glycyl, serine, methionine. So this is the name of the tripeptide. And this is the structure of the tripeptide that you end up with. So GLY, SCR, MET or GSM. So let's talk about protein structure. Let's start with the primary and secondary levels. Now the secondary structure of a protein it basically describes the structure that forms when amino acids form the hydrogen bonds between the atoms in the backbone and the atoms on the same or the other side of the peptide chain. So the secondary structure in silk is called as a beta pleated sheet. So we'll talk more about it as we go along. Let's start with the primary structure of proteins. So a protein is a polypeptide of 50 or more amino acids. Remember this part, this is very important. When do we name, not when we start naming something as a protein and not a peptide, is when you have a polypeptide of 50 or more amino acids, that when we call a structure a protein. So notice that proteins are really large structures. That's the reason why if you consider one amino acid is big, imagine a polypeptide of 50 amino acids. So this is the idea behind a protein. But what, do we, what defines a protein separate is because of its biological activity. So anything that does not have a biological purpose is a peptide. And if the protein ends up becoming a biological activity, involved in the biological activity, we call it a protein. Now uh, the primary structure of a protein is basically the particular sequence of the amino acids that held together, that are held together by the peptide bonds. So for example here, this is the peptide that has alanine, leucine, cysteine and methionine. And all of these have, you have one, one, two and three peptide bonds. So it is alanyl, leucyl, cysyl, methionine. So this is the tetrapeptide that we find here. So for example, if you take the thyroid hormone, so the thyroid hormone that stimulates the release of thyroxine is a tripeptide with an amino acid sequence of GLU, GLU, HIS, PRO or EHP. And although other amino acid sequences of these three amino acids are possible, but only specific sequence or the primary structure produces the hormonal activity. Notice that you can have different, different uh, you know, combinations, but this is the particular sequence that results in the hormonal activity. That's why we call this a protein and not as a peptide. So this is the primary structure of insulin. Notice the continuous chain of amino acids connected by sulfide bonds. You have sulfide bonds that are connecting these structures. So insulin was the first protein to have its primary structure determined. And it has a primary structure of two peptide bond, peptide chains linked by disulfide bonds. And it has a chain A, so this is the first chain. So the chain A has 21 amino acids and the chain B here contains 30 amino acids. And both are linked by disulfide bonds. So let's try and answer some questions for the tripeptide here. So they have given us a tripeptide and they're asking us which is the, what is this the N terminus. So the N terminus is this structure. The C terminus is this structure. What is the name of the tripeptide? Notice that first structure that we need to know is what is this structure first. So we know that it's a phenylalanine 1 and next you have this structure here. So next is this structure and the last one is this structure. So we need to figure out each of these structures and what they what, what they are named after. So the first structure is phenylene. The second structure is alanine and the last structure is cysteine. So, so the last structure is alanine again. Right? Sorry. The last structure is alanine and the middle structure here is cysteine. So this is phenyl alanine. This is cysteine this is alanine. So 
so how would you name this structure the n terminus goes first so if you have phenyl alanine so ion will go out so it becomes alanyl so phenyl alanyl and you have cysteine becomes cystyl alanine as the last structure the c terminus always has no change in its name so this is the structure of the tripeptide that we have here so the n terminus here is phenyl phenyl alanine alanine and you have alanine on the C terminus. So they are asking us to write the names and the three letter abbreviations of tripeptides that could form from two glycines and one alanine. So you have two glycines and one alanine. So you have GLY, GLY, alanine. So GLY, ALA, GLY. And you have ALA, GLY, GLY. So these are the three structures that you can form from uh, two glycines and one alanine. So pause the video right here. You already know the structures. Use the slides from before or from the textbook. Try to note down the right structure for glycine, glycine and alanine and write down the original uh, tripeptides that are actually forming from this structure. Next let's talk about the tertiary and the quaternary levels. So the tertiary and quaternary levels are rep represent, we generally use them to represent the ribbon model, to represent the tertiary structure of a polypeptide chain. This is the one that forms either myoglobin, which is generally a globular protein. So let's start with the structure, the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure of a protein is the overall three-dimensional shape that it formed by the interactions and the repulsions of the amino acid residues in different parts of the chain. For example, the fibrous protein of alpha carotene creates an alpha carotene structure which is generally created by an alpha helix structure which wraps together to form fibrils of hair and wool. Now when you take the tertiary structures, so the tertiary structures are generally included by the stabilizing interactions of the tertiary structures that are detailed here. For example, you have one amino acid that are interacting with the different part structures of these uh, structures here. One of them is hydrophilic interactions which involves occurs when you have external aqueous environment and the polar amino acid residues pulling them to the outer surface of the protein. Next you have hydrophobic interactions that occur when you have non-polar amino acid residues forming a non-polar center at the interior of the protein and you have salt bridges that are ionic attractions between the charges of acidic and basic residues of amino acid residues. And you have the final one, fourth one which is the hydrogen bonds which are the ones that bond between the hydrogens of polar residue and the oxygen and nitrogen of the or a nitrogen of the second polar amino acid residue. And the last one is the disulfide bond which are the covalent bonds that form when you have SH group of two cysteine residues that are oxidized removing the hydrogen creating the disulfide bond. Now these interactions between the amino acid residues fold the polypeptide into a specific three dimensional structure and that three-dimensional structure is what we call it tertiary structure. For example, you have alpha sheets, you have beta pleated sheets, I'm sorry, you have alpha helixes and you have beta pleated sheets. These are formed, these are bonded between the N terminus and the C terminus are generally connected from one structure to the other structure either by hydrogen bonds or disulfide bonds or hydrophobic interactions or hydrophilic interactions or hydrogen bonds or salt bridges. So this is how the entire structure comes together to form a tertiary structure. Now, so they are asking us to indicate the type of protein structure each of them is. Number A is a polypeptide chain held side to side by hydrogen bonds. So whenever you have a side to side structure, it is a beta pleated sheet, remember this part. Next you have a sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain, so which is a primary structure. A corkscrew shape with hydrogen bonds between the amino acids. So a corkscrew shape is an alpha helix, three peptide chains woven like a rope, so that is a triple helix. So one structure st covering over the other structure. So this is how the interactions generally happen inside the structures here. So and this is how we can name the structures. So now let us talk about globular proteins. So let's start with the first one, myoglobin. 
so globular proteins are generally the ones that are the largest of all the proteins these are compact spherical shapes formed when you have sections of the polypeptide chain fold over the top of each other as a result of interactions between the amino acid residues and these are the ones that are responsible to carry out the work of the cells such as synthesis transport and metabolism for example you have myoglobin which is a globular protein that stores oxygen in the skeletal muscle and it generally contains about 153 amino acids in a polypeptide structure with about 3/4 of the chain in the alpha helix secondary structure next you also have fibrous proteins such as alpha and beta carotenes so fibrous proteins generally contain long thin fiber like shapes that are involved in the structure of the cells and tissues there are two types of fibrous proteins one is alpha carotenes the other is beta carotenes alpha carotenes make up the hair wool skin and nails and they generally contain three alpha helices that are linked by disulfide linkages that coil together the peptide chain like a braid right so if you have you have seen a braid a braiding of your hair that's an example of a fibrous alpha carotene structure beta carotene is generally found in the feathers of birds and scales of reptiles and generally contains large amounts of bleta pleated seed structures so the depending on the functioning so depending on the structure the function varies as well for example alpha carotenes make up the structure of hair wool skin and nails beta carotenes generally make up the beta sheets which are generally responsible for the feathers of birds and scales of reptiles next to finally we come to the quaternary structure which is the example let's take the example of a hemoglobin now biologically active proteins with two or more polypeptide chains or subunits generally will have a quaternary structure for example take let's take hemoglobin hemoglobin is a globular protein that transport oxygen in blood and consists of four polypeptide chains it has two alpha chains with 141 amino acids and two beta chains with 146 amino acids so this combined structure also contains a small ligand structure so these are generally called ligands ligands are small structures connected to the original protein and these are the ones that are responsible for the quaternary structure of the protein in the quaternary structures the subunits are held together by the same stabilizing interactions in the tertiary structures but each subunit of the hemoglobin here is a globular protein with an embedded heme say a heme group notice that this is the external this embedded heme group is also called as a ligand and that ligand contains an iron center that can bind an oxygen molecule this ligand most commonly are transition compounds so transition element complexes so in common name we also call these the coordination compounds so hemoglobin and myoglobin will have the have the same biological function they generally carry oxygen in different parts of the body for example hemoglobin carries oxygen in blood but myoglobin carries oxygen in the muscle they have different molar masses myoglobin has a molar mass of 17000 hemoglobin has a molar mass of 67000 they have really similar tertiary structures but they carry different amounts of oxygen because myoglobin carries one oxygen molecule whereas hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules so the type of ligand and the number of ligands that are attached is representation of the quaternary structure of the protein so protein start from they contain so they start from the primary secondary tertiary and often quaternary structural levels you start from a primary structure of linkages of amino acids and the secondary structure which is the interactions between the residues of the amino acids and third creating the interactions from the secondary structure then create a three dimensional shape the three dimensional shape then can embed external coordination complexes which create the quaternary structure of the protein so let's let's talk about uh, one of the main diseases that that happens due to uh, the abnormality of the hemoglobin protein so which is sickle cell anemia so sickle cell anemia is caused by the abnormality in the shape of one of the subunits of the hemoglobin protein for example a normal beta chain in hemoglobin contains glucine but a sickled beta chain contains valine and this is a non polar amino acid and but glucine originally is a polar amino acid now the sixth amino acid in the beta chain which is the polar acidic glutamic acid is replaced by a valine a non polar amino acid 
which creates the non-polar R group on the valine is attracted to the non-polar regions within the beta, homo, beta hemoglobin chains. The red blood cells change from a rounded shape to a crescent shape. So that's the reason why we call it a sickle, which interferes with the ability to transport enough oxygen. That's the reason why it ends up not having enough oxygen, which creates lesser energy in the body, which creates the structure, which creates the anemic characteristics in the body. So this is a normal uh, RBC and this is a structure that is beginning to sickle and this is the completely sickled red blood cell. Notice the change in the normal red blood cell and a sickled red blood cell. Notice the crescent structure. The crescent structure creates the problems here. Now these hydrophobic interactions can cause sickle cell and hemoglobin molecules to stick together. Now, these hemoglobin inter hydrophobic interactions can cause the molecules to stick together and they form insoluble fibers of sickle cell hemoglobin that can clog capillaries, it can cause inflammation, pain and organ damage, it can also cause low oxygen levels in affected tissues. So this is the, uh, the link between sickle cell anemia and the change in the structure of the hemoglobin and how one single amino acid can result between a diseased red blood cell and an undiseased red blood cell. So next, let's talk about the last topic, protein hydrolysis and denaturation. So what is the denaturation of a protein? It occurs when the interactions of the residues that stabilize the tertiary or quaternary structures are disrupted, which generally can destroy the shape and render the protein biologically inactive. For example, when you heat up egg, the egg here it loses its protein structure because of the heat and it undergoes a process of denaturation. This happens when it is either heat, acid, base, heavy metal, salts or agitation. All of these can result in uh, protein denaturation. So let's talk about first protein hydrolysis. So these peptide bonds here are generally broken through hydrolysis reactions. The reason because we, talk, we already talked about peptide bonds are result of de dehydrolysis which means that when we remove dehydration which means when we remove hydrogen wa water it results in the formation of a peptide bond. So when you add water they end up becoming individual mono amino acids. So these generally occur in the stomach when enzymes catalyze the hydrolysis of proteins to give amino acids. They break up the primary structure by breaking the covalent peptide bonds that lick the amino acids. So for example, alanine glycyl serine under hydrolysis can create alanine, glycine and serine. So the combined structure. Next is de denaturation of proteins. Denaturation occurs when a change disrupts the interaction between the residues that stabilize the secondary, tertiary or quaternary structures. Now these originally do not affect the amino acid amide bonds between the amino acids but rather affects the uh, stabilizing bonds in the secondary structure of the protein. Now the loss of this secondary and tertiary structure in the proteins occurs when conditions change. The conditions that change are increase in the temperature, making the pH very acidic or basic, adding certain organic compounds or heavy metal ions and adding mechanical agitation. So when the interactions between the residues are disrupted, you can have unfolding of the globular proteins. The tertiary structure ends up disrupted and the protein is no longer biologically active. So the first out of these processes is heating. So proteins are generally denatured when you heat above 50 degrees centigrade and the heat can disrupt the hydrogen bonds and the hydrophobic interactions between the pole non-polar residues. Uh, this does not change the nutritional value of the protein but makes them more digestible. That's the reason why you actually heat up food rather than taking the food directly into your own body. The reason why you cook food is because when you cook food, you're breaking up the individual uh, proteins into their basic amino acids, pro pro basic uh, primary or secondary structures that increases the chance of digestion in your body. So high temperatures are also used to disinfect surgical instruments and gowns by denaturing the proteins of any bacteria that are present. This is how bacteria can die at high temperatures. Next is acids and bases. Proteins can also be denatured by changing the pH because Changing the pH can break the hydrogen bonds and can also disrupt the ionic bonds and the salt bridges in the structure. For example, a tannic acid is a weak acid that is used to used in burn ointments 
when it's applied to the site of the burn to coagulate proteins it forms a protein cover protective cover and prevents further loss of fluid burns next is organic compounds so organic compounds such as ethanol and isopropyl alcohol can act as disinfectants by exchanging the bacterial proteins hydrogen bonds to water with their own and second is disrupting the side chain intramolecular hydrogen bonding so when you use an alcohol swab to clean a wound or to prepare the skin for an injection we generally do that because the alcohol passes through the cell walls and coagulates the proteins that are inside the bacteria next is heavy metal ions heavy metal ions such as silver lead and mercury can denature proteins by forming bonds with the ionic residues or reacting with the disulfide bonds for example a dilute solution of silver nitrate when you placed in the eye of a newborn baby to destroy the bacteria that causes gonorrhea so denature of proteins can also be created by agitation for example the whipping of cream and the beating of egg whites are natural examples of using mechanical agitation to denature the proteins so it unfolds the primary structure of the protein and resulting in the expansion of the original structure now for example the whipping action basically stretches the polypeptide chains until the stabilization interactions are disrupted so these are the four things that can be done heating above 50 degrees ends up breaking the hydrogen bonds hydrophobic interactions between the nonpolar residues examples of this are cooking food autoclaving and surgical items you have acids and bases this generally disrupt the hydrogen bonds between the polar residues and they also destroy the salt bridges examples of this is lactic acid from bacteria which denatures the milk protein in the preparation of yogurt and cheese you have organic compounds such as that they generally disrupt the hydrophobic interactions for example ethanol and isopropyl alcohol which are used to disinfect wound wounds and prepare skin for injections help in the removal or breaking of the cell walls of bacteria heavy metal ions are generally disrupt the disulfide bonds in proteins by forming ionic bonds examples of this is mercury and lead poisoning which can create the body to interact with uh, these metals and break down the structures which can cause mercury which can break up the structures and form the most common example of this is breaking of the bonds in the cell walls of the esophagus on the stomach the last one is agitation agitation generally disrupts the hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions by stretching the polypeptide chains and disrupting the stabilizing interactions so an example of this is whipped cream mering that's made from egg whites that also can be an example of agitation so in this lecture we started discussing about proteins we start we talked about the amino acids that contain the amine ammonium carboxylate and r groups that form the zwitterions at their isoelectronic point we talked about peptides that are formed from amino acids and we talked about primary secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures and we also talked about protein denaturation denaturation and hydrolysis we started with hydrolysis which gives the amino acids or we can do denaturation which generally changes the shape of the secondary tertiary or uh, quaternary structure of the proteins either from heat acids and salt acids and bases organic solvents heavy metal ions and agitation so with this we end our lecture on amino acids and proteins